Welcome, Trudy. How did you get interested in this subject? Well, hi, Margie. Thank you very much for having me here today. And uh, this summer, this past summer, I turned 64 years old. And that the age of 64 is an age that is laden with extra meaning for me because it's the age when my father died. And I was 31 at the time, and he died unexpectedly from a medical error. And he was a very wise, compassionate, patient, and successful man. And he mentored and inspired a lot of people, including me. And his passing was very tragic for a lot of people, including me. <laughs> and furthermore, he was in perfect health at the time. So it was even more tra tragic and sad. And so for me, from this point onward, from the age of 64 going forward, every single year that I get to live is a year that he didn't get to. And so I feel like I need to make these years into a gift, kind of, a gift that I give back to him and to others and to myself by aging well and by making these years especially meaningful. And to do that, I'd like to see a future ahead of me that's at least equally meaningful and fulfilling as the first 64 years of my life. But here's the catch, I think, in our culture. And it prevents us, our culture prevents us uh, those of us beyond the age of 50, unless you're on the fast track and a CEO, from ever envisioning a future that's even remotely as meaningful and fulfilling as the first half of our lives. So I decided to try to figure out why that's so. And I started plowing through research books and studies and blogs and you name it in an effort to understand and then to make better sense of all this. And so my new book, which is entitled how to peak at 70 and beyond, unlock your genius as you age, is a direct result of all of these studies and my research and trying to make meaning and sense for myself and for my dad and others in the second half of life. Well, that's a terrific story, Trudy, and I really commend you for having the vision and turning a tragedy into motivation for the next phase of your life. That sounds fantastic. Now. You've been, you know that I'm interested in neuroscience and in how we can unleash the genius inside of us. So I was really excited when you started telling me about your book and your research. What was the biggest surprise you found from all of that work? Well, uh, Margie, I found several surprises. And one of the first surprises I came across, I started to study baby, baby boomers and longevity, and um, which I'm a baby boomer. And we will live, one in four of us will live to be 100 years old, will become a centenarian. And this is simply unprecedented in history. Um, my husband and I were watching a TV show the other night on ancient Egypt, and they were talking about their lifespans of 35 to 37 years old. And now we live, you know, approximately 60 years longer than that, almost triple their lifetimes. But then the next surprise in my research was that um, our society just simply hasn't caught up with this kind of developmental model that equates for our new extended lifespan. An entire new period of life, our elder years has emerged. And we really have no idea what it means to us or what to do with it. We're kind of still stuck in sort of a youth obsessed model that might've worked in ancient Egypt but really has very little relevance now and is in fact hurting us and I think even hurting our planet. So one of the things I've done in my book is to propose new stages of development and decline that you know across our extended lifespans and ones that aren't based on the lifespan of ancient Egypt but more suitable for quantifying the lifespans we live now and can expect to live in the future. I also developed new definitions of, of peak performance that are more in tune with these new extended lifetimes. So Margie, I'm kind of throwing all of the old models and definitions out to uh, de defining and evaluating peak performance in this new lifespan. And furthermore, one of the key things I'm doing is I'm not using an old outmoded model of evaluation, what I call the base animal instincts model. And that's essentially a model that defines peak performance that's derived from the animal kingdom. And it's built around our abilities to reproduce, one, primary. And to do this, we must excel in our ability to fight, take flight, or to dominate. 
So instead, I built a model which I call the transcendent model, which redefines peak performance around advanced human abilities, not the animal kingdom, that only a very advanced human being could achieve. And I think it's a far better and healthier model, not just for those of us past 50 to use, but for all of us to use as a guide. The transcendent model, however, does favor age and experience, where the older you get, the more likely you are to excel, at least up to the point where senescence begins, which I also redefine in my book. Wow. So I'm, Go ahead. Okay, so I'm applying this new scale, Margie. Another really big surprise I uncovered in my research is just how many people over the age of 50 are wiser more thoughtful and more emotionally capable in certain ways, far more competent and potent than ever before in their lives. And using this new scale of development, they're peaking well past the age of 50 and into their 780s and beyond. And so after I changed the scale to advanced human model, um, I began to find example after example of high performers, even throughout history, well past the age of 50, and I began to see a new inviting, far more inviting and compelling future that had previously been closed uh, to all of us. Okay, now now I get to say, wow, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but I didn't mean <laughs> to say it out loud, but I was just so excited to hear what you're talking about. And you know, it, it, it fits so closely with what I've been doing because I tell everybody who works with me that we are in an unprecedented age of neural discovery we're understanding what our brain does and that means that for the first time we really can determine how it develops we can channel our energy in such a way that we can keep our brains healthier which i'm sure you found in your research as well and we can stimulate our brains and we and it is true that an older brain has more connections it has deeper connections and it is normally capable of greater wisdom and of seeing the bigger picture simply because it has continued to learn and continue to evolve. And I really think we are at this unprecedented time where we are going to physically change as a species. It's happened several times before. The last time was about 30,000 years ago. You've heard of this missing link. Well, we as a species, we changed from pre-human very advanced apes that are no longer on the planet to human beings in only 30,000 years and they can't find a gradual change. That's why they call it a missing link. What they find is this huge leap forward and in evolutionary terms 30,000 years is is nothing. It's It's a snap of your fingers and you're talking about the same thing that we've suddenly got so much more life that was available even back in ancient Egypt. Um, which, again, in evolutionary terms, is not that long ago. In fact, it's a shorter period than what I'm talking. So we're going, to, we're going to learn things. All of us who are alive today, we're going to learn what's really possible for human beings. And it's going to be very, very surprising for all of us. So let's see if we can narrow this down. What are three things our listeners can do today to start preparing to keep peaking? well into their 70s and beyond? Well, I think the because of the way our culture is, I think the absolutely necessary first step, Margie, is to uncover our own false beliefs about aging. Our society simply bombards us with false beliefs, I mean, every day, everywhere, about aging. And here's a, here's a kind of a clever exercise for you to do. Go on to Amazon.com and go into the health and beauty section and search on the words anti-aging. Over 164,000 products come up. I, I searched on insect repellent and I think it was about 50,000. <laughs> Can you imagine what would happen if that number of products were available on the market that read anti-gay or anti-African-American or anti-Hispanic? Lawsuits would erupt everywhere. Yet our society collectively fears age so much and has pushed this fear down to such a subliminal, pervasive level that we all engage in the same false beliefs about aging. And those false beliefs are stunting our personal growth and our futures, not just for those of us over 50, but I think for all of us. There's that 
biblical saying, as ye believe, so shall ye receive. And right now, we all hold a collective cultural consciousness that aging is bad and fearful. And so we try to together distract ourselves and hold aging at bay. And the consequence of that is, is that we then enter into some really ill-defined wasteland after the age of 50 with no healthy self-concept. And when in fact, once you start to study it, there's all kinds of role models of what I call blooming and peaking individuals, very advanced human beings past the age of 50, if we just quit using outmoded scales of evaluation. So I apologize for saying this, but what I recommend, the first step is read the book because in it, I give you a self-assessment that helps you uncover your own false beliefs about aging. And then it gives you exercises in belief reversal. It's only seven simple questions, but if you're truly honest with yourself, I think you'll find your answers to be very revealing and illuminating. My next recommendation is then to um, take the second self-assessment in the book. It's another really simple 11 question self-assessment to help you uncover your own one of a kind genius or giftedness that you've earned and developed through the aging process. And you probably don't even fully realize, respect or know how um, you can apply your own genius in the second half of life. And then you wanted three. So finally, my third recommendation is that using what you've learned from these two self assessments, you completely redesign your vision of life after 50. And now at whatever age you're currently at, so that's no longer some kind of ill defined wasteland, but a place where you will thrive and find, you know, not only renewed meaning, but brand new meaning. And I think elderhood is a place, Margie, where um, we achieve the kind of maturity that human beings were meant to achieve all along. And it's not built on an animal-based model that rises and falls around our ability to reproduce, but rather it's built around a new transcendent model that rises and falls with our ability to give back and from within the zone of our own unique passion and genius from our gifts earned primarily through the experience of aging. Okay. Now, those of us um, who are listening today, um, and I count myself among that group who are in that 50 plus group and are thriving. And I, I think both definitely you and I are, are great role models for how you can completely redefine your life and at any age and thrive in it. Um, one of the things I've discovered in my work is that the brain and the body are really one, one unit, one system. And so often people try to separate your brain health and your body health, and you really can't do it. The brain is connected to the body. The neurons that are in the brain are the same neurons that are in the tip of your finger. And it's in constant communication with everything going on in your body. So it's a little wonder that if you're not feeling very well, your thinking is a little fuzzy. And the other thing is true is that your brain has tremendous power to help you sustain body health, to help you sustain energy and strength and power. So what are you personally doing to support your own brain body health? Well, one of the kind of unusual things I'm doing, and as you talk, Margie, it makes me think even it is sort of a, a linking between the brain and the body. But I just bought a walking desk and I recommend it for everybody. I have no affiliation with the walking desk people at all. But my walking desk, um, for anybody who sits at a computer or works at a computer, and if you can find a way um, to get a walking desk, it, it allows me to walk five miles a day just while I'm working. Um, but earlier, Margie, you asked what I found that surprised me in my research. And one of the things I discovered is that our rate of decline, our rate of physical decline as we age, well, physical and mental, is constant. So most people mistakenly believe that as we get older, we decline faster and faster. But that's simply not true. It's not scientifically supported. It, we do kind of bear the accumulation of decline, but our rate of decline is constant and it forms a steady straight line on a graph when you look at huge groups of people, of course, not just one individual's lifetime. So as far as my own personal health, 
that was a huge eye opener for me and it improved my positive view of my own healthy future. And of course, my studies also told me we do decline in some ways as we age, such as physical prowess, and many of us also suffer some short term memory loss. We also lose our ability to reproduce and we experience those associated hormone changes. But our culture chooses to accentuate and amplify those losses and almost nowhere do we read of the gains. The other thing we tend to minimize, and I go into this in depth in, in my book, is that every age experiences mental and physical problems. They're just a different set from ours, and we tend to forget that. So I go into babyhood and teenagehood, early adult, midlife, and show how each of those has its own set of mental and physical challenges um, that can be really daunting. And it helps you sort of um, recontext uh, the way your own life. So when I compare where I am now to all the other ages I've been, I've grown in just so many ways. In fact, I was thinking if you pitted my 64 year old self against my 30 year old self, I would outperform her in almost every, every single way except physically. My research helps me focus on and find all of the gains of aging that our culture chooses to ignore and they don't certainly don't advertise. Um, and this knowledge helps my mental and physical health tremendously. And those gains that I've discovered are many. Uh, I give you a self-assessment in my book to help you identify your own genius and giftedness that you've earned with age. And not only do you have one of a kind gifts that you'll discover, but um, our age group, uh, you know, as a group has a number of competencies that actually increase and improve as we age. One aspect that improves and increases with age is our emotional maturity. And there's this really cool thing called this. It's uh, the poignancy scale. It's a scientific measure and it measures a person's ability to process and hold simultaneous complex emotions, such as when you might experience sadness and anger at once. Or for instance, when a baby is born and you cry and laugh and experience joy and love and heartache all at the same time. It turns out that older people score way higher on the poignancy scale than younger people. And because we are older and have seen so many seasons pass by, our emotional prowess is much more advanced than that of younger people. And this is, uh, this is so not in spite of our age, this is so because of our age. And we're able to process and experience more complex emotions than other people. That's, a, that's just a really powerful competency. So you asked what I'm personally doing to support my own brain and body health. My research itself, and it, I'm very passionate about it, it's exciting to do, has completely changed the way I look at myself as an older person in our society. And to me, that's the single most fundamental act any one of us can take at any age, really, to su support our own brain and body health because it just makes your future look so much brighter. Um, the more I uncover the science, research, and role models and what I call the new heroes, they completely redefine what it means to be a powerful and competent elder in our culture. Let's talk about those heroes a little bit. I would love to um, have you share a few examples of people who are already doing this peaking that you're talking about. Well, um, oh, one of the pe people is Al Gore, who, um, if you study his life, He's now at a place where his, uh, you know, through his, through his history and his political background and his leadership and uh, also the, I think he was the CEO of Gore, um, Gore-Tex or, or whatever that one was. But anyway, all those skills have combined to make him someone who's actually trying to save the planet. He's trying to put together um, a whole cadre of youngsters and people of all ages that he's educating uh, so that they can work on that and talk about talk about a skill set. I mean, that is an advanced skill set way beyond the animal kingdom, way up into advanced human beings. And then I also show in my book kind of this, I, I think it's a really illuminating graph of the, of the life of Nelson Mandela. And if you look at his life and part of it, it was stunted by the years that he was in jail, but even there he was perfecting his advanced human skills, 
all the most amazing things he did are well beyond the age of 60, 70, 80, 90, and, and on until finally he reaches senescence. And if you look at um, Pope, Pope Francis, he is, uh, you know, traveling the world, uh, whatever your religious affiliation is, you, you, I don't think you can argue that he's transforming the Catholic Church. And he's, uh, I think he's 78 years old now. He has uh, half a lung on one side and he's absolutely transformational. And the skills he using, use, is using, these are not uh, animal kingdom skills. Those are advanced human skills and, you know, very highly competent. Great examples, Trudy. And I would add to the list, I'm, I'm pretty sure you would agree, the Dalai Lama and Mother Teresa are a couple of other great examples. And, and I, um, I always cite them both in my book as well, and I, I agree. It's a little harder to find females, but as you go along, Jane Goodall is another person that just kept advancing and advancing. Um, Barbara Streisand is somebody who across has just done all kinds of philanthropic work, and she's um, the only person alive, I think, who's had a best-selling uh, record. I, I, I don't even know if they're called that anymore in all six decades. And so there's there's some amazing people out there. I think she's 78 now, I think. That's great. And of course, if people want to learn more, the best thing they can do is come and see you at Brain Matters. We're really excited to have you. But in addition to Brain Matters, where can someone learn more about you and your work? Well, the first thing you can do if you don't have a, a good memory, I believe you could, if you just go on Google, and I tried this and maybe it only works for me, but if you tr uh, type in Trudy, and it's T-R-U-D-I, Baldwin like piano and author in Google, and my Facebook page will come up, and so will my website come up. But I do have a Facebook page under Trudy Baldwin Author as well. And I just want to um, remind you that my book, my uh, nonfiction book, Unlock Your Genius As You Age, How to Peak at 70 Beyond, is not out yet. It should be very soon. Uh, but the other two are out. Well, I'll ask you to definitely, um, because not only is this going out in audio form, but the link will be in our newsletter, and that's probably where a lot of folks who are listening to us right now, how they got to this page to listen to this podcast, to just keep me posted when it is available, and I'll be happy to send out an update to all of my followers so they can get the book. Oh, that'd be great, Margie. Thank you. Okay. Now, one last question, and I ask this of everybody. What are you working on right now that has you most excited? Well, I'm, I'm working on my next book, and it's um, called Elderhood, Are You Worthy? And it goes into the seven superpowers of elderhood. But one of the things I'm looking at is how to achieve balance in the second half of life. And I think it's different from any other stage of life. And we kind of look at the uh, mid, midlife years as, a, as doing, doing, doing. And then suddenly we sort of have this vision that you hit elderhood or seniorhood or whatever, and it just flips and you're just being, or you're supposed to be playing or who knows exactly what you're supposed to be doing. But I don't think that is the optimum balance for kind of holistic health. And so I'm conducting further studies to find out exactly what is the optimum balance. And I think it's sort of a balance between um, doing and a thoughtful doing um, and applied actions that kind of balance um, can, and this kind of balance can do for us as individuals, but also we, where we give back to society and the planet. Another real interesting study I'm conducting for my next book is exploring the science of hope. And um, if we have hope, we suddenly get energy for life and for health and for love and for passion and for so much regarding the quality of our lives. So I'm looking into what I call, and these are my own terms, agents of hope agents of despair and the gray agents that fall somewhere in between. And an agent can be anything. It can be a situation, an event, an action, a person that either uh, anything that turns on a sense of hope or turns on a sense of despair in us. And if we could learn how to regulate our agents of hope and manage them better, every aspect of our lives would improve. And so, Margie, you asked what excites me, and I just feel so excited and privileged to be able to get up and work on these subjects every morning. 
I get to live and study and create from my passion zone, and which is what I recommend for people to do. And I have no idea how long I'll, I'll live. I hope to live to be a centenarian. But every single day past the age of 64 is a gift that my dad never got. And so I'm going to treat it as a very special blessing. And Margie, I, I appreciate the opportunity so much that you've given me here today to talk about my new book and my ideas. Thank you. Well, you're welcome, Trudy. And I'm so glad you could join us. This has been Margie Meacham, and I've been talking to Trudy Baldwin. And the next time you'll be able to see her will be at Brain Matters 2015, November 10th and 11th. I hope you join us. And Trudy will definitely have you back when you have that second book out. So thanks, everybody. This is it for this session. And join us next time.